Greetings, everyone. Uh, to start, uh, I'd like to thank the entire team of this event for the invitation. I want to introduce myself quickly before starting the talk. I'm Dr. Mike Kalawicki, specialist in osteoporosis and metabolic bone diseases. It's a great honor for me to be part of the International Forum of Women's Health in USA 2021. I'm in the United States and I'm glad to share with all my Latin American colleagues who are watching this chat on demand right now. In my career as a physician, I've worked and done research on osteoporosis and metabolic bone diseases. I've served as Director of Bone Health Tele-ECHO, which stands for Extension for Community Healthcare Outcomes. I'm President of the New Mexico Osteoporosis Foundation, member of the Board of Trustees of the U.S. National Osteoporosis Foundation, and past president of the International Society for Clinical Densitometry. Today, I'm here to share with you my experience and research on metabolic bone diseases and how different pathophysiological entities impact bone. I hope that this information is of interest and that it enriches your professional skills uh, with women's health care. I'm now going to start with the presentation. Here is my disclosure. I want to begin uh, with telling you about uh, a Latin American regional audit that was conducted by the International Osteoporosis Foundation in 2012. And this was led by Dr. Jose Zanqueta from Argentina. And you see in the right hand part of this slide uh, some of the other individuals from Latin American countries who were uh, involved in this audit. An executive summary of the audit uh, focused on 14 Latin American countries that you see listed on the top. Uh, what they found was that there is extreme lack of epidemiological data uh, that has to do uh, with the number of people having uh, fractures and the consequences of fractures. Important factors in considering osteoporosis uh, were identified as population growth and aging of the population, which is expected to result in many more fractures in the future. It was also highlighted that there was limited access to DEXA, dual energy X-ray absorptiometry, and limited access to treatment. Here you see a, a study that was published in a, a journal called Osteoporosis International in 2005 about the number of DEXAs uh, in countries around the world in 2003. And I've highlighted uh, Latin American uh, countries, and you can see compared uh, to many other uh, countries, there were fewer DEXA units per million population in Latin America than some other parts of the world that you see in the bottom part of the graph. If we go forward to uh, data from 2011, and look at DEXA units per million population with different Latin American countries, you see quite a, a large range. Uh, at the bottom, uh, Brazil and Chile have uh, about 10 units per million population, which is approximately one-third what we have in the U.S. Uh, towards the top of the right-hand graph, you see that other countries, uh, such as Bolivia and Guatemala, Nicaragua at the top, uh, have uh, two or fewer DEXA units per million population. So this limits access to diagnostic services, which are often uh, very, very helpful in managing patients with osteoporosis. Uh, this is a photo from uh, my facility, New Mexico Clinical Research and Osteoporosis Center, where we have uh, two uh, DEXA machines. And here you see our DEXA uh, technologists. This is an easy procedure from the patient's point of view, but requires a highly skilled uh, technologist to do a good quality test. 
content. Here is a, a paper that was published this year looking at challenges and opportunities for quality densitometry in Latin America. And on the left you see some of the challenges that were identified. Uh, lack of data, as was found in the audit in 2012. There were geographic and infrastructure uh, barriers. I mean, Latin America comprises a very large area with a very large number of people in the populations. Uh, national health care priorities were uh, important, and often osteoporosis was not a health care priority. There was limited health care funding devoted to osteoporosis, uh, lack of recognition on the importance of DEXA, a need for training and certification, lack of quality standards, and competition from other illnesses that might have a higher priority. Uh, in this article, strategies to improve care were identified, such as uh, improving the epidemiological data, having universal access to health professionals and quality densitometry, uh, policies to ensure access to skeletal health care, funding to support these policies, and recognition of osteoporosis as a health care priority. Now, quality uh, DEXA has uh, been an important concern of the International Society for Clinical Densitometry. And here is a publication on DEXA best uh, practices, and it uh, identifies a key criteria for uh, acquisition analysis and interpretation of DEXA. And one of the ways to recognize a good quality DEXA is that there's one diagnosis and one level of fracture risk identified for each patient. Uh, many uh, computer-generated DEXA reports uh, will say, uh, a different diagnosis for each skeletal site that's measured and a different level of fracture risk, which is quite confusing to physicians looking at these reports. It was also noted that precision in assessment and calculation of least significant change is required in order to do quantitative comparison of bone mineral density measurements. Incorrect acquisition analysis and interpretation can be harmful to patients. It can generate uh, ordering of unneeded laboratory tests or perhaps changes in medication that might not be needed. And the ISCD uh, offers training and certification that can uh, help to educate physicians and technologists about the importance of quality DEXA testing. Now, osteoporosis is a skeletal disorder characterized by compromised bone strength predisposing to an increased risk of fracture. And bone strength reflects the integration of two main features, bone density and bone quality. And on the right-hand side of the slide, you see trabecular bone, as we have in the inside of our vertebral bodies, for example. At the top is normal uh, bone, uh, with a good, robust trabecular structure, and the bottom represents uh, an osteoporosis uh, bone. And you see that the trabecular components are thinner, there's wider spacing, uh, and there's holes and uh, uh, disruption of the trabecular structure. So it's easy to understand how that bottom image is going to be a weaker bone than what you see at the top. This illustrates very nicely uh, what we think is uh, the lifetime course of bone density. Uh, the top line represents men having peak bone mass at some time in their 20s, probably by age 30, and a slow age-related uh, bone loss thereafter. Now, women are a little bit different. Women have a lower uh, peak bone mass and a more precipitous uh, decline in bone density around the time of menopause, uh, subsequently followed by an age-related rate of bone loss. And a woman who is a rapid bone loser may lose 3 to 5% of bone mass per year 
in the first three to five years after menopause. And in fact, even in the menopause transition, uh, prior to cessation of menses, women may begin to lose bone. So this is a dangerous time in a woman's skeletal uh, life and a time where we need to pay attention. This illustrates the bone remodeling uh, process, and I'd like to just uh, briefly uh, describe what's going on here. Uh, this uh, whole area represents a bone resorption pit, as you might see on the surface of trabecular bone. Uh, there are lining cells uh, that are normally covering the surface of the bone. And in response to an activating process, such as a microfracture, for example, there's a disruption in the lining cells. And these multinucleated cells called osteoclasts attach to the bone surface, secrete uh, enzymes that dissolve the bone matrix and the mineral uh, in the bone. This is bone resorption. Uh, the bone resorption process in an area like this takes place over about two to five weeks. Uh, following that, uh, there is uh, 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 several cell types, including macrophages, that clean up the debris from the bone resorption process, followed by osteoblasts, these smaller, more numerous cells that produce osteoid, the protein matrix of bone that subsequently becomes mineralized. It is the fate of osteoblasts uh, after they do their job making bone to become these lining cells or become osteocytes, which you see below here, embedded in the bone mineral. Osteocytes are by far the most numerous of bone cells and uh, they are uh, the master uh, organizers of the bone remodeling process, and they produce cytokines and proteins that help to regulate osteoclastic bone resorption and osteoblastic bone formation. All of this takes place under a canopy of lining cells, as you see here, in a discrete, uh, isolated uh, unit, uh, and there's perhaps one million of these bone resorption units in our bones at any one time. This is a wonderful uh, cartoon that was created uh, by the late Sergio Raji Ice from Vitoria, Brazil, uh, a wonderful uh, orthopedic surgeon who had a strong interest in bone diseases. And this just illustrates the osteocytes here, the most numerous of cells, uh, controlling what the other cells are doing. The osteoclast is uh, creating little holes in the bones, and here are osteoblasts filling in the holes. And if all is in balance, uh, the osteoblasts fill in uh, the same amount that has been taken away. So uh, a very nice and humorous uh, illustration of the bone remodeling process. Just to show you that this uh, really happens in our bones, uh, this cell is an osteoclast, and uh, you can see what the cell looks like. Uh, this is in a cell culture, and you can see uh, here that it is actually moving along the surface of the bone and creating a small uh, microscopic hole in the bone. Uh, here is an osteoblast, uh, which is producing osteoid, the protein matrix of bones, that subsequently becomes calcified. And here is an osteocyte. And now these are a, a little bit like uh, neurons with many of these uh, connections. So an osteocyte uh, connects with other osteocytes. It connects with the uh, bone surface and it produces compounds uh, such as rank ligand, which is a regulator of osteoclastic bone resorption, and sclerostin, which is a compound that regulates uh, osteoblastic bone formation. So these are actually uh, the brains of our bones that uh, tell our bones uh, when 
to resorb, form new bone. Now let's turn to women and the difference uh, between premenopausal and postmenopausal women. On the left, you see uh, what's going on at the bone surface. Uh, you see the osteoclast here uh, creating a little bone resorption pit. Uh, osteoblasts have been filling in this pit. And these are some of the regulators of this. Uh, one that's called rank ligand, which stimulates osteoclastic bone resorption. Uh, Sclerostin, uh, which inhibits osteoblastic uh, bone formation. Uh, estrogen actually uh, blocks these uh, small uh, proteins and has a beneficial effect on bone density. So when an adequate amount of estrogen is around, what we expect is that there's a balance between bone resorption and bone formation and that bone density stays relatively stable. Here is the situation on the right with an estrogen uh, deficient woman uh, where there's less estrogen than before. There is a higher level of rank ligand so a greater stimulation of bone resorption. There's an increased level of sclerostin, which means um, effects on bone formation. Uh, the net result is that there's an increase in bone resorption. At the same time, there's an increase in bone formation, but it's not enough to make up for the amount of resorption. So. Uh, bone that's being filled into this bone resorption pit is a little bit less than what was removed. And ultimately, bone loss will occur. And what we can expect is that uh, there will be a decrease in measurable bone density. And ultimately, osteoporosis is the possible and when deformable consequence. Now, the bottom line for all of us is patient care. And this is a real person. This is uh, a photo from my personal family album. This is Aunt Edna. On the left, you see her uh, in her 50s. She's a fine, uh, straight standing woman. And on the right is Aunt Edna about 20 years later after having severe postmenopausal osteoporosis with multiple vertebral compression fractures. And I think it's uh, the goal of all of us to see that none of us have anyone like Aunt Edna in our own personal family albums, that our patients don't wind up like Aunt Edna, and that we ourselves uh, don't end up like Aunt Edna. Now, here is a postmenopausal woman, the kind of person that I often see in my office. And sometimes when she comes in, she asks the question, will I end up like my mother, who might have been someone like Aunt Edna? So what do we do? Well, first we want to assess fracture risk. We want to determine whether risk is high enough that intervention with pharmacological therapy should be considered. We want to evaluate for factors contributing to osteoporosis. We want to select uh, the best treatment for this patient to reduce fracture risk. And we want to follow up the patient to be sure that they adhere to therapy and take medication long enough to benefit from it. So I'm going to begin with fracture risk uh, assessment. And the tools that we have uh, easily available are clinical risk factors and FRACS, a fracture risk assessment algorithm and DEXA if it's available. It's important to understand that age is considered to be an independent risk factor for fracture. And you can see with any given T-score or bone density uh, represented on the X-axis that the fracture risk changes according to age. So. Uh, imagine a T-score of minus 2.5, which classifies as osteoporosis. If you're 80 years old on the top line, uh, your risk is almost twice as high as if you were 50 years old. And in younger premenopausal women, uh, even with a very low T-score, uh, the risk is reasonably low 
and not nearly as high as it would be in an older woman. A prior fracture is an important risk factor for future fracture, and especially a recent prior fracture. Uh, this shows you the risk of a major osteoporotic fracture in the five years after having a fracture of the hip, shoulder, or clinical vertebral fracture. And you see that the risk is very high in the first one to two years after a fracture and is less in subsequent years. Uh, the risk never returns to baseline, uh, but it is so high in the first couple of years that this represents an urgent medical uh, condition. And that's why patients who have a recent fracture uh, need to be uh, quickly evaluated and interventions uh, considered to reduce the risk of that next fracture. Now, these are the technologies that we have uh, available for measuring uh, bone density in different ways. Uh, DEXA at the top that's highlighted measures aerial uh, bone mineral density, which is a, a two-dimensional projection of a three-dimensional structure. It is uh, by far the most versatile of all of these technologies, and we can use it to diagnose osteoporosis, uh, predict fracture risk, we can use it with the FRAX algorithm, and we can use it to monitor patients. Uh, unfortunately, these uh, devices uh, are more expensive than some of the others, and it does involve ionizing radiation. P-DEXA that you see below, that is a peripheral DEXA. Uh, that's a smaller uh, device that's uh, portable and can measure bone density at peripheral skeletal sites, such as the forearm and the wrist. QUS is quantitative uh, ultrasound. Uh, these are less expensive, uh, do not involve ionizing radiation, and uh, can be used to predict fracture risk, but uh, we cannot use these devices to diagnose osteoporosis, and they're not very good to monitor therapy. Uh, there are some newer uh, devices, uh, one called PEUS and another called REMS, R-E-M-S, that use various forms of ultrasound that uh, provide interesting new technologies. Uh, QCT is quantitative uh, CT scanning that can actually measure volumetric uh, BMD. Uh, that involves more radiation and is more expensive than DEXA. And there are peripheral QCD devices. And for research purposes, we have something called high resolution peripheral QCT scanning. Now, FRAX is a, a fracture risk uh, assessment tool that uh, is available at no cost. Uh, it uh, can be retrieved online, and there are smartphone apps that can do this. Uh, there are calculation tools for Latin America. Uh, we don't have them uh, at this time for other countries. Uh, the benefits of FRAX are that it's free, it's available anywhere, and importantly, it can be used without measurement of bone mineral density by DEXA. And it's included in many uh, clinical practice guidelines, and treatment uh, can be started, I think, based on FRAX. So in places where DEXA is not available, uh, FRAX is a terrific tool to help make clinical decisions. The limitations are it's only validated in seven Latin American countries. It works better if you have uh, femoral neck bone mineral density to include in the algorithm. It can't be used to monitor treatment. It involves uh, what I'm calling dichotomous input. That means for clinical risk factors such as uh, glucocorticoids or uh, previous fracture, it doesn't account for the range of risk associated with these things. And it doesn't include all risk factors such as falling, for example. But it can be very helpful in making clinical decisions, especially when DEXA is not available. Now, once we've evaluated fracture risk, uh, we need to consider uh, whether uh, it's time to think about starting pharmacological therapy. 
Uh, we do have a consensus statement on osteoporosis prevention and treatment in Latin America that was published a few years ago. Uh, here uh, on the left you see the WHO diagnostic criteria. If the T-score by DEXA is minus 1.0 or greater, that is considered normal. Osteopenia is between minus 1 and minus 2.5. Osteoporosis is a T-score minus 2.5 and below, and severe osteoporosis is an osteoporotic T-score and a history of fracture. And this is something we apply to postmenopausal women and men aged 50 years and older. Uh, here on the right, you see indications for treatment. If a patient has had a fragility fracture, regardless of the fracture, regardless of the T-score, uh, treatment should be considered. Uh, here uh, on the left you see menopausal women and men aged 50 years and older. Uh, here on the right you see indications for treatment. If a patient has had a fragility fracture, regardless of the T-score, uh, treatment should be considered. If the T-score is minus 2.5 or below, that is an indication for treatment. And if the T-score is between minus 1 and minus 2.5, and the fracture risk assessment by FRAX meets the country-specific treatment threshold, treatment should be considered. And of course, you can use FRAX without uh, bone density if you don't have it. In the U.S., um, the threshold for treatment is a 10-year probability of major osteoporotic fracture, 20% or greater, or a 10-year probability of hip fracture, 3% or greater. Next, uh, we need to evaluate four factors uh, contributing uh, to osteoporosis. Uh, as uh, with all disorders, we begin with a medical history, in this case, uh, focused on uh, skeletal history. So we want to ask the patient if they've had previous fractures, family history of fractures, uh, if childhood skeletal development and muscle development was normal, we want to ask them about falls, um, find out what medications they're on. Uh, some can be harmful to bones, like glucocorticoids. Uh, what osteoporosis treatments have they already had? We always ask what their maximum height was. What's the tallest they ever were when they were in their 20s? Uh, lifestyle, previous surgery, we have more and more patients with bariatric surgery for obesity that can cause malabsorption and have adverse skeletal consequences. We want to mo know more about their diet and how much calcium they get in their diet, for example, and uh, review of symptoms very briefly. The key component of physical exam is getting an accurate height measurement with a wall-mounted stadiometer, a little device you attach to the wall that can give you an accurate height measurement. And when there's been at least 1.5 inches of height loss, uh, that suggests the possibility that they could have a vertebral fracture, and you may want to get uh, x-rays or images of the spine to find out if they have a fracture. You want to evaluate them for muscle strength and balance to see what their risk of falls is. Uh, look at their gait. Uh, we look at the sclera because blue sclera can be a sign of osteogenesis imperfecta. If they're kyphotic or have a small rib pelvis space, that could be due to fractures in the spine. Uh, any kind of skeletal Deformity is important to note. Certain kind of rashes can be associated with systemic mastocytosis and celiac disease that can cause osteoporosis. If they have a tremor from Parkinson's disease, that can increase the risk of falling. Uh, hepatomegaly uh, may be an indicator of chronic liver disease that can cause malabsorption. And other things on physical exam to consider. I think all patients should probably have a complete blood count, uh, blood chemistries. In the U.S., we do what's called a comprehensive metabolic profile that includes uh, tests of uh, kidney function and calcium. Uh, I also think all patients should have a phosphorus measured at least once, since some disorders of phosphorus metabolism can cause 
low bone density and fractures. Uh, we look at the albumin uh, to do an albumin correction on calcium. If uh, uh, albumin is uh, off, that may affect the total calcium measurement. ALP is alkaline phosphatase, which can be uh, too high or too low in some patients with osteomalacia. Uh, liver function studies are, are important. Uh, we measure serum 25-hydroxy vitamin D in all patients at least once. And the 24-hour urine for calcium and sodium can be a screening test for calcium malabsorption. And on the right, you see other tests that uh, may be helpful in selected uh, patients, but certainly uh, do not have to be done in all. Uh, finally, for treatment, uh, we always think about lifestyle and nutrition, and for some patients, medication. So a lifestyle uh, means uh, adequate dietary uh, intake of calcium and protein. Uh, we recommend in the U.S. 1,200 milligrams of calcium per day in the diet. Uh, adequate uh, vitamin D, and we have a target range for serum 25-hydroxy vitamin D of 30 to 50 nanogram per milliliter. Uh, we also recommend regular weight bearing and muscle strengthening physical activity. And for some patients, medications. This little uh, cartoon represents uh, what is going on uh, with bone resorption and formation. At the top, you see healthy premenopausal women. Uh, these are bone resorption pits. And this is after osteoblasts have filled in the pits and everything is in balance. So just as much is being replaced as has been taken away. This represents estrogen deficient women and what you see is there are more bone resorption pits and they are deeper. More bone is resorbed than in premenopausal women. And bone formation cannot keep up with this. So there's only partial replacement of bone that's been taken away and a net loss of bone density over time. We have a class of drugs called anti-resorptive medications that slow down the bone remodeling process. So you see in a postmenopausal woman who's been treated, uh, we have a slower rate of bone resorption, so the bone resorption pits are not as numerous and not as deep as they were here. And hopefully if the medication is working well, uh, these are uh, completely filled in. There's another class of drugs called osteoanabolic drugs. So here uh, you see a postmenopausal woman with a high rate of bone remodeling. With the anabolic agents, what we're doing is filling in the bone resorption pits and in fact, overfilling them. So we're replacing more bone than has been taken away and we're actually restoring uh, the bone structure in ways that we're not able to do with anti-resorptive agents. And I'll tell you more about that in a few minutes. So here uh, we give you an idea of the mechanism of action of different pharmacological agents. And I'd like to begin uh, with, uh, well, let's start with estrogen. So we see estrogen here along with SERMs such as raloxifene, a selective estrogen receptor modulator. Uh, what these agents do uh, is uh, inhibit uh, the uh, osteoclastic bone resorption uh, process. And this uh, sees that premenopausal women uh, have a good balance of bone remodeling. Bisphosphonates, such as alendronate, abandronate, and resedronate, and zoledronic acid, are small molecules that attach to the bone surface. And when ingested by osteoclasts, cause the osteoclast to separate from the bone and inhibits its activity in bone resorption. Uh, bisphosphonates are 
generic, uh, they are inexpensive, and they're widely used in the treatment of osteoporosis. Calcitonin is uh, rarely used anymore in the U.S. It's probably the weakest of the anti-resorptive agents, but it has a mild anti-resorptive effect. Denosumab at the top is a fully human monoclonal antibody to rank ligand, rank ligand being the principal regulator of osteoclastic bone resorption. So when denosumab attaches to rank ligand, it inhibits uh, the formation and differentiation and lifespan of osteoclasts, and it's the most uh, Im a potent antiresorptive agent that we now have. And this is given as an injection a sub Q once every six months. Strontium ranolate is uh, a medication that was formerly manufactured uh, in France and uh, used in many countries around. It is uh, a medication that was formerly manufactured uh, in France and uh, used in many countries around the world. It's my understanding that it's no longer manufactured because of safety concerns. Uh, PTH uh, in the form of uh, two medications, teraparatide and abaloparatide are potent uh, uh, stimulators of bone formation. So these are anabolic drugs that stimulate osteoblast uh, activity and form uh, bone in ways that we're not doing with antiresorptive agents and can improve bone structure. And here we have an anti sclerostin antibody uh, called Romososumab, uh, which is uh, available in the US. This is given as sub Q injections once a month for 12 months. Uh, it um, attaches to sclerostin and it results in an increase in bone formation. So uh, in a nutshell, uh, this is the mechanism of action of the approved medications that are used in the treatment of osteoporosis. Now NAMS, the North American Menopause Society, has a position uh, statement on the use of hormones for osteoporosis. And they've stated that hormone therapy Therapy prevents bone loss in healthy postmenopausal women, that hormone therapy effectively prevents postmenopausal osteoporosis and fractures, that women in the estrogen therapy and estrogen progesterone cohorts in the Women's Health Initiative intervention trial overall had significant reductions in hip fracture. Bone protection dissipates rapidly after hormone therapy discontinuation, but no rebound in fracture risk has been found. When alternative therapies are not appropriate or cause adverse events, the extended use of hormone therapy is an option for women who are at high risk of osteoporotic fracture. And the decisions to stop hormone therapy should be made on the basis of extra skeletal benefits and risks. And here is a, a classic uh, study that was published uh, many years ago. Uh, what you see here is the decline in bone density in the years after bilateral uh, OO forectomy. And this is what you can expect, uh, similar to what you might see after a natural menopause. If you initiate estrogen therapy at the time of OO forectomy, uh, bone density is stable. However, even starting estrogen therapy later on, here starting about three years after oophorectomy, there is still a nice response to estrogen and actually an improvement in bone density for the first couple of years. And here going out to about five years after oophorectomy, again, uh, you see a good response to estrogen therapy with stabilization. So the best response to estrogen is starting at early, after oophorectomy, but even up to five years later, uh, there is still a response to estrogen. Now, here you see a, a list of all of the pharmacological agents that we have. On the left are the anti-resorptive agents, on the right, the anabolic agents. So we have at the top four bisphosphonates, 
denosumab, a, a human monoclonal antibody to rank ligand, raloxifene, which is a serum, calcitonin, estrogen, and bazadoxifene combined with estrogen. And on the right, you see uh, the three anabolic agents and romososumab, which has a unique dual effect, actually, of increasing bone formation and decreasing bone resorption at the same time. The question is, how do we select uh, among all of these choices? Well, recent guidelines from the Endocrine Society and the American Association of Clinical Densitometry suggests that we stratify fracture risk. And according to factors uh, such as uh, T-score and prior fractures, for example, um, we can identify a level of risk as being low, moderate, high, or very high. And depending on the level of risk, uh, we might choose our pharmacological agent. So when the risk is low, uh, non-pharmacological therapy is appropriate. If it's moderate, uh, maybe non-pharmacological, possibly a bisphosphonate. When the risk is high, uh, we consider bisphosphonate, denosumab, or CIRM. And in the very high risk category, uh, this is when anabolic therapy might be considered with teriparatide, abaloperatide, or romososumab. Now, you may not have all of those drugs available in your country, but uh, uh, probably you have teriparatide. And that uh, is given as a, a daily self-administered sub-Q injection, usually for two years. Now, anabolic therapy is superior to anaresorptive therapy for very high-risk patients, and we now have evidence from four head-to-head randomized controlled trials, and I've lifted those here with references uh, below. All of these are in men or uh, women uh, with very high risk of fracture. And I just want to highlight uh, the one at the bottom, uh, comparing teriparatide to resedronate in a head-to-head -head trial called Vero. And what you see here is uh, data from uh, Vero. And you see that as early as 12 months, fracture risk is uh, lower in teriparatide-treated patients than resedronate, and that continues out to 24 months. Looking at the time to first clinical fracture, there's a separation of these lines beginning around six months uh, with much lower fracture risk of teriparatide than resedronate. So the sequence of therapy is important. Uh, anaresorptive followed by anabolic may result in a delay or attenuation of the anabolic effect. Anabolic uh, followed by anaresorptive is essential uh, in order uh, to enhance and consolidate the benefits of anabolic therapy. Anabolic followed by anabolic is probably neutral, and anaresorptive followed by anaresorptive um, may be associated uh, with a greater bone density effect with a more robust anaresorptive, especially with denosumab after a bisphosphonate. And finally, we need to follow up for adverse uh, after a bisphosphonate. And finally, we need to follow up for adverse uh, follow up for adverse uh, events response to therapy and sometimes, we might consider treat the target. This is a paper that was published uh, not too long ago saying that treatment should be selected according to the likelihood of achieving an acceptable level of fracture risk. A patient may respond to therapy yet still have an unacceptably high risk. Response to therapy is essential but not necessarily sufficient in achieving an acceptable level of risk. And we know from studies such as this that there's a very robust correlation between increases in bone density with treatment and the magnitude of fracture risk reduction. So a greater increase in bone density translates into a greater reduction in fracture risk. So what I tell patients is that all approved osteoporosis drugs increase bone density and reduce fracture risk, but only anabolic drugs build new bone. 
when fracture risk is very high, it's ideal to begin with an anabolic agent. Anabolic therapy must be followed by an antiresorptive drug to consolidate and enhance the benefits achieved. And I tell them osteoporosis is a lifelong disease that warrants lifelong attention and that all drugs stop working when they're stopped. Often patients don't understand that, so I show them models that show something like this. On the left, you see a transiliac bone biopsy of a woman with osteoporosis, and on the right, you see a biopsy of the same woman after 21 months of teriparatide. A wonderful illustration of the changes in bone structure that a patient might expect with anabolic therapy. Finally, uh, I want to say a few words about bone health teleecho, which is a form of technology enabled collaborative learning. Uh, in the US, uh, we have uh, a number of uh, what we call hubs uh, that have these uh, weekly or monthly telemedicine programs that connect uh, with individuals across the country. We started this at University of New Mexico here. Uh, in 2015. And we call this a hub and spoke system and you can see that we link uh, with healthcare professionals across the country and not only that in many other countries including some Latin American countries and once a week uh, we have uh, an interactive meeting where we discuss osteoporosis cases and uh, talk about treatments. We talk about clinical practice guidelines and when to treat patients outside the guidelines. So to summarize, there are exciting advances in the field of osteoporosis. Uh, there is a large osteoporosis treatment gap and much yet to be done. If you want to learn more about bones and discuss cases, uh, uh, information below is how to register uh, for Bone Health TeleEcho yourself. And if you can't remember any of that, you can Google uh, Bone and Echo. And finally, uh, in contrast to Aunt Edna, this is a good story about osteoporosis. This is a patient of mine uh, who was uh, treated for postmenopausal osteoporosis. I told her that weight-bearing exercise was good for her bones. And she took me to heart. She went to a, a local gym, got interested in powerlifting, and actually won in her age group in a local powerlifting contest, and eventually uh, went to powerlifting contests around the country and became a nationally ranked powerlifter in her age group and fortunately never had a fracture and did very well with her bones. It illustrates uh, that good lifting technique is important and that you can live an active life even though you have osteoporosis. Uh, I'm not encouraging you to tell your patients to take up powerlifting, but certainly you can have a very active and full life even with osteoporosis. So thank you for your attention. That's it for today. I consider that the information I just shared with all of you will contribute to attendees at an academic and scientific level. And I invite you to continue investigating these issues since as you know, this knowledge generates important health and wellness benefits to our patients. It's time to say goodbye to all of you, dear Latin American colleagues. Thank you very much for your attention and I wish you warm greetings from the United States. Until next time.